Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea and Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Bless you, are you Simon the son of Jonah? For the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gift gates of Hades will not prevail against it. <clears throat> I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And our epistle lesson comes from Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the Spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united, and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purposes. But with humility, think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Friends, these are the words of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, search our hearts, we pray. Help us to find the message that you would have us hear in these words. Help them to build us up to your service in the kingdom to bring you glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Do you know how you got your name? I think most of us naturally ask that question at some point in our lives. Usually when we're kids, those kids who are not brave enough to come up here today, you ever wonder where your name came from? You ever ask mom or dad? What were you told? Maybe you were named after a parent or a grandparent. My father-in-law has an unusual first name. It's pronounced Bayard. It's spelled B-A-Y-A-R-D. Raise your hand if you've heard that name before. Yeah, I didn't think I'd get too many hands on that one. Couple back here, couple back here, very good. Don't trust the choir people, I don't know. About that. <laughs> so I decided to look up the, the name Bayard, and the earliest reference I could find is a legendary French horse that had a supernatural ability to adjust his size to that of the rider or riders on his back. So I can't wait to tell my father-in-law that when I uh, meet with him for lunch today. I said, did you know you're named after a magic horse? <laughs> uh, sure, that'll be a lot of fun. And he is the third in a line of Bayards. He is Bayard Sylvester Cook III. And uh, mercifully, my brother-in-law was spared becoming the fourth with a name like that, but he's proud of his name. And he's even more proud of his nickname, which is Styx, S-T-I-X. So given to him at a young age for, I think he carried around drumsticks at one point, he was a drummer at some time, so uh, the name Styx has stuck with him for, uh, for, for a very long time. It's a fun name to call him. 
People sometimes even have asked me how I received my name. So I'm going to take you all back a little bit. I was born in 1971, and uh, it was around that time that uh, a TV show was on the air. It had just run for a few years. It was called Family Affair. Raise your hand if you've heard that or watched it. Oh, yeah, quite a few of you. Yeah. So you remember the kids who were on that show, Buffy and Jody. That's right. That's right. Thank God that the boy was named Jody in that show, and I inherited that name rather than Buffy. Not, no offense to any Buffys out there, I'm sure you're lovely folks. Then I wondered, do people still, when they're looking and researching names for their children, do they still find books in the bookstore for these sorts of things? Yeah? Um, I remember, I used to see them in the checkout lane at the Publix, and uh, they used to have little baby name books. I don't know if they still do that or not in these days of the internet, when you can find everything on the internet now. And uh, of course, I found plenty of baby names on the internet too. And one of the best sites that you can go to to find baby names, uh, at least throughout history and up until last year, is the Social Security Administration. Of all things, they run this fabulous database and they show, you know, where the baby names were, the most popular ones. So, and over the past 100 years, you can look up your birth year and find whether your name was in fashion at the time or whether you're just another oddball like Jody. Because I naturally was curious, looked up 1971, and my name wasn't even in the top 20. I didn't find it at all, so I was pretty upset. Can you guess what number one was, for boys anyway? Michael. Michael. Yeah, yeah. Michael. And in fact, except for one year, when it was number two, Michael was the most popular baby name from 1954 to 1998. It had some serious staying power. Recently, I found that William has climbed back into the top five for boys after being absent from that part of the list for the past six decades. So we call that one now a classic or a retro name, an oldie but a goodie, if you will. So any Williams out there, you know you're hip all over again. And as you know, William is the first name of Shakespeare. And the title of today's sermon today, What's in a Name, comes from one of Shakespeare's most famous plays, Romeo and Juliet. Scene two of act two, Juliet says the famous words, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. One excellent description of this declaration I found says this. Here, Juliet tells Romeo that a name is an artificial and a meaningless convention, and that she loves the person who is called Montague, the family name. She doesn't like the Montague name necessarily, nor the Montague family. And Romeo, out of his passion for Juliet, rejects his family name and vows, as Juliet asks, to deny his father and instead be new baptized as Juliet's lover. This one short line encapsulates the central struggle and tragedy of the play and is one of Shakespeare's most famous quotes. What do you all think of Juliet's statement regarding names? Do you find names to be artificial and meaningless conventions? Sounds a bit harsh to me. And one other author I read makes quite a contrary claim. His name is Gregory Clark. He's an economic historian at UC Davis. And he wrote a book called The Sun Also Rises. Now, this is not to be confused with the novel by Hemingway. In this case, sun is spelled S-O-N. Contrary to most economists who prefer to measure such things like success only through income levels, Clark analyzes social status, not merely economic mobility within a class, but a more comprehensive metric that he labels general social competence or ability. Now, I, I found this information on Clark's book in a review of the same in uh, The Atlantic magazine. And this review goes on to say this, Clark's method relies on the tendency in most societies for a son to bear his father's surname, hence the book's title. Specifically, Clark measures the persistence of status by looking at what has happened over time to groups of people bearing names that, at some point in the past, generations or even centuries ago, indicated socioeconomic status either well above or well below that of the general population. 
And the results were remarkably consistent. Clark again and again finds evidence of far less mobility, uh, a much slower rate of convergence towards the society's general population from either above or below than what researchers using conventional methods have concluded. In other words, what Clark is saying is that our names are a strong indicator of our social status, and the rate of change of that status is something that takes generations to alter. Maybe all of us are thinking again about our own names. Are they really indicative of our social status? Well, in today's Gospel lesson from Matthew, Jesus asks his disciples two key questions related to his name. The first one is, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the second, who do you say that I am? I think in light of these questions, it would be helpful for us to ask some of our own. And the first question we should ask is, what do we call ourselves? Now, I'm not simply talking about given names. I'm not talking about thumbing through baby books or uh, looking on the internet. What about the titles that we acquire in our social or in our career lives? Those of you uh, in the working world, in the corporate sphere, may strive to attain a title like Vice President of Development or Chief Technical Officer or some such. In the church, titles go in and out of fashion as well. Thus, in the past two years, we've had a shift in emphasis away from simply calling them elders and ministers of word and sacrament to this other dynamic of ruling elders and teaching elders. Now, the names we used before are, are still good, and people know what we're talking about when we say those. They're, they're just simply, uh, in my estimation, out of fashion. And then we get even more specific with some of our titles for pastors. Uh, we might give them specialized names, especially if they're temporary ministers, like um, stated supply or temporary supply. We have these folks that we call parish associates in the past, and some churches still have them. And, and some people wonder, well, what, what does that mean? And then we have, of course, people like an interim pastor, uh, whom you all expect to have one coming here very soon. How important are these names and titles to us? Do they go beyond mere identification? Do we depend on them for validation as well? As you all are thinking uh, about that, I'll go ahead and move on to what's perhaps a more easier question for this passage. And that is, what does Jesus call himself? In this passage, Jesus knows who he is and what his unique mission is. But the end of that mission is as yet so scandalous that he cannot reveal it. And about the only title he uses for himself in Matthew up to this point is this son of man phrase. Now, to give you some understanding about that, in the scripture of, of his own time, that was a pretty humble title. I'll give you a couple of examples from the Old Testament. From the Psalms, we hear, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man, that you care for him. And in Job, we read this. How then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright, and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less man, who is but a maggot, a son of man, who is only a worm? Don't you just love the Old Testament? You're never going to hear maggot in the New Testament, I guarantee you. Up to this point in Matthew's Gospel, others have called him certain titles like Lord, Son of God, Son of David. And these titles are rare and special, often uttered in times of great need or distress. But no one has yet addressed him in public as the Christ, which is the same as the Messiah or the Anointed One. And this is a very special figure, especially among the, the Jews of the time, who were expecting uh, someone to come to restore their political and social fortunes as a whole, a figure who would deliver them from the hands of their overlords, who at this time were the Romans, of course. And it seems to me that this is why Jesus is asking his disciples what people call him. 
He wanted to know what the word on the street was about him. And in this way, we are reminded that Matthew and, um, and even Mark are gospels of timing. Jesus is content to be revealed most fully, not by what people call him, but by what he does in fulfillment of these titles. And as it turns out, of course, he has a much bigger task in mind than political upheaval. His task is salvation of humankind. But in the course of carrying out this task, how does Jesus relate to the rest of us? In other words, we come to our next question. What does Jesus call us? You might know from John's gospel that at one point he's preparing his disciples for life after his departure. And he calls them at this point friends. But in the case of Jesus calling us, I don't think it's as important what he calls us, what he names us, as the fact simply that he calls us. In this part of Matthew, he has already called the twelve to journey with him. My father was an electrician, and before he was licensed, he was called a journeyman. This is something that pops up in the trades, this, this title. I see the disciples in this light more than apprentices, for they had already been sent out at one point to cast out demons and to heal the sick. But they were not yet finished with their teaching. They were journeying with Jesus. They were journeymen, but they still had much to learn. Classic example of that is something that happens right after this story. Right after this, what I call a gold star moment of Peter's, where he is uh, suddenly gifted with this insight into Jesus' actual identity, he turns around and scolds Jesus for defining what it meant to be the Christ, that he would have to be killed and that he would rise again. We have those moments too, don't we? We want to put Jesus in a nice little box of our own making instead of letting Jesus call the shots. That begs the same question that Jesus posed to his disciples, our closing question today. What do we call Jesus? At home, when Ellen and I want some background music, I'm going to show my age again, we frequently turn to the 70s music channel. And I always get a chuckle when certain songs come on. They were most popular during a, a subculture of the, of the hippie music culture of the late 60s. And this turned into the, what were known as the Jesus Freaks. And they uh, put out some, some music that sought to name Jesus too and to identify him. So one of these is that classic from the Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just all right. I can't imagine that to be a terribly convincing endorsement these days. Imagine a stranger coming in here and saying, who do you worship? Jesus Christ. Well, who is he? You know, he's just all right. Just all right. But in this song, the doobies call Jesus my friend. And so does a fellow named Norman Greenbaum in the song Spirit in the Sky. You know that one too? Yeah, taking you all back today. In this hit, Norman uh, sings, I've got a friend in Jesus who sets him up with a spirit in the sky which to me sounds a little bit like a blind date, kind of, kind of weird, but okay, I'll go with it. But my favorite of these uh, Jesus Freak songs is one that was recorded by several folks, the biggest hit of which recorded by a band named Ocean, and it's called Put Your Hand in the Hand. This song never identifies Jesus by name, but it does exhort the listener to put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. All right, maybe you never liked those songs or maybe you've never heard them. So how else do we find out how we can name Jesus? Well, the most obvious place to me is we have the benefit of scripture, which gives us more titles for Jesus than we can count. I've already noted several that have appeared in Matthew. People have called him son of God, son of man, etc. But we can look to the scriptures for others like Prince of Peace, or the Good Shepherd, or the Word of God. The section of Philippians that we hear today gives us another song, one with a bit more theology behind it than those well-meaning 70s tunes. And it's probably a piece of an early hymn whose singers would have praised the name of Christ, who humbled and emptied himself 
to become human and to die a demeaning death in order that we might have life. And as a result, this hymn fragment says, all the inhabitants of heaven and earth can only respond authentically by taking a knee and shouting that earliest confession of the church, Jesus Christ is Lord. But when we make that confession now, Jesus Christ is Lord, in this time when we are still waiting for Christ to return, what does it look like? David Luz frames the question this way. Who do you say he is? Not just say when repeating a creed, but say with your lives, that is with your relationships, your bank account, your time, your energy, and all the rest. Who do you really say Jesus is? In the wake of so much horrific news lately, news like Christians and other peaceable folks driven from their homes to a lonely mountain of suffering and peril, news like the society of a beloved, the suicide rather, of a beloved actor, news like Israel and Hamas trading rockets for seeming no good while people suffer even more than usual, an incident in our own heartland where baseless suspicion of the other in a domestic police force that itself is grossly misrepresentative of the people it is supposed to serve, responds to protest with an overwhelming show of militaristic force. In the wake of all of this madness, who can we really say that Jesus is? David's answer is striking in its depth and simplicity. He says, I think Jesus is God's way of showing us how much God loves us and all people. God is so big that I think we have a hard time connecting with God. And so God came to be like one of us, to live like one of us, in order to reveal just how God feels about us. In this sense, Jesus revealed God's heart, a heart that aches with all who suffer depression and think seriously about ending their lives. A heart that is upset and angry when a young black man is shot dead for no explicable reason. A heart that is torn up in grief at the desperate situation and violence that rips apart the land we've named holy. A heart that loves us like only an adoring parent can. And so not only wants the best for us, but is always eager to welcome us home in grace, forgiveness, and love. But it's more than that too, he writes. He writes, I think Jesus also came to show us what's possible. And so rather than give in to the threat of disease, Jesus healed. Rather than surrender people to demons, Jesus showed compassion. Rather than let people starve because there's not enough to go around, Jesus fed people who were hungry. Jesus refused to be satisfied or limited by the status quo and invites us to do the same. Because if Jesus' life and death show us how much God loves us, then Jesus' resurrection shows us that that love is more powerful than hate and fear and even death. As you all are in these final stages of uh, finding uh, solid pastoral leadership, starting with an interim pastor here, you, the people of Tuscawilla Presbyterian Church, will continue to be empowered by the reality of who Jesus is, even as you are humbled by it. I pray that that reality continues to compel uh, both you and your leadership to proclaim the name of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed, in word and action from Tuscawilla to Timbuktu and beyond. The question for your interim to be the question for Tuscawilla Presbyterian Church. And the question for all of us is not just what's in a name, but what's in the name of Jesus Christ? The simple answer is life everlasting and love never ending. Amen.